Foreign ministers from BRICS countries held high-level talks in Cape Town in the past two days. Their BRICS bloc is made up of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. The meeting was a precursor to a larger BRICS summit scheduled for August in Johannesburg. For more on this, we're joined by Sanusha Naidu, who is a foreign affairs expert and senior research associate with the Institute for Global Dialogue. Sanusha, thank you so much for making time for us this afternoon. Uh, maybe let's start with what we have seen happen in the build-up to where we are now, where we are hosting these foreign ministers. We have been attracting a lot of diplomatic attention, um, all this attention from these global players. The U.S. representatives were here over the last couple of months, European reps, the Russian foreign minister has been here before. We did military exercises with China and Russia. What do you think is the country's strategic focus when it comes to BRICS? now that we're chairing the BRICS group of countries? Uh, good afternoon, Clem Clement, and, and good afternoon to your viewers. I think it's very important to contextualize foreign policy and contextualize the role that countries play when it comes to their international relations and affairs and the kind of engagements they have. There's a common phrase in foreign policy analysis around agency, but also in terms of how much does the domestic influence the international and vice versa. More importantly, I think interests are critical to how do you define your strategic impetus in foreign policy. So I think for South Africa, we must go back to the to the kind of reasoning or the kind of motivation and lobbying that the Zuma presidency made in becoming a member of the BRICS. And remember, 94, South Africa was very much seen as that kind of strategic uh, middle power actor that could play a bridging role, act as an interlocker between um the continent, the southern African region, in the global south, uh, and with its partners in the global north. I think over time, that strategic impetus that you're talking about within the BRICS and why South Africa joined, there were a number of reasons. I think uh, one in terms of where South Africa wants to position itself within a, a group of countries that would seem to be key drivers of uh, the global economic arena in terms of their output, their emerging, uh, emerging market power, their GDP output, their demographics and so forth. And I think it was the Jim O'Neill article that kind of added that catalyst to the, to the formation. But some, some some analysts uh, argue that the formation of the BRICS actually precedes Jim O'Neill in a sense that they were coming together nevertheless around some of the challenges that the global architecture represents. So I think in the context of South Africa, it was about the multilateralism, about the go global governance reform, the, the way in which the international architecture needed to, to evolve in the manner of representing the voice of the global south and South Africa playing that kind of role. I think over time, there's been... Uh, questions around whether South Africa's leveraging of its international relations, its diplomacy, its global uh, identity and its positioning and footprint, has it really delivered the kind of strategic impetus, but also in terms of the fact that has it actually aligned to its national interests that's aligned to the dom do domestic development agenda. And these are some of the, 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 the points of contestation and contention that we see today. But unfortunately, we've also now caught up in the fact that South Africa is, is in, in, in this predicament on, on, on the fact that in the early period of 94, South Africa played the role of a moral citizen, global moral citizen. You know, it, it looked at institutional issue, uh, institutional uh, governance issues in the, in the global arena. It, it, it aligned to them. It became signatories like the ICC. And then, of course, you must remember that in international relations, it's always about what the a uh, member of parliament in the British uh, legislature, Lord Charles Palmerston, said, it's nothing that you have permanent friends in international relations and in global affairs and foreign policy. It's about how do you have permanent and evolving interests. And that's a paraphrase. So I think, again, interests are interesting, are, are, are critical. But again, the question is, you have to read the, the evolving nature of the international system. And unfortunately, South Africa finds itself in a very distressing uh, state of affairs when it comes to the question of the BRICS because there's a lot of body blows South Africa has been taking on the fact that South Africa has not done what some commentators have, have argued that is to basically align to some of the more uh, traditional questions around how it plays out its politics in the global arena when it comes to obligations like the ICC, etc. That in itself is important. South Africa has to uh, basically take on that responsibility and uh, align to those obligations. I don't think anyone's disputing that. 
But it's the mm. way in which that narrative is evolving that also becomes critical to what's happening domestically in the country and what's happening outside of the country and the implications this is having. Yeah. If you listen to the foreign minister, uh, 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 minister Pando's press briefing on Thursday evening, it's also about what's the collateral damage that, that countries, not just in South Africa, but the global South will suffer in terms of being part of issues that are not of their own making. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm interested to, 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 to know where, whether there's clarity around what our position is now. Maybe let's take, for instance, the backlash that um, this country has received regarding its relations and proximity to Russia. And, and the question a lot of people have been asking is whether the West at all is worried about the prevalence of not just Russia, but China as well on the mm -hmm. continent, particularly you know, South Africa. I, I, is the U.S. feeling threatened, especially now that even other countries have raised interest to join this blog? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it's really about unpacking the international system today and unpacking what has become serious geopolitical cleavages and deepening of those tensions and, and uh, challenges uh, where you see, for example, at the recent G7 summit, the statement coming out called economic coercion, uh, very interestingly pointing to the direction of China, the rise of China, the relationship China has with countries outside mm. of uh, not just the Asia region, but in Africa and, and, and positioning itself in Latin America as well. And I think it represents a challenge to the status quo. So once the status quo reaches this tipping point and this inflection point where it's no longer the preserve of a few, but rather now it's becoming much more fluid and it's becoming much more open in terms of the rise of institutions. And in international relations, we have the cyclic approach where you have the rise and fall of nation states. It's theory. We've been taught this as, 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 as scholars of international relations that Every cow, every kind, it, it, it's either called long cycle theory or it's called uh, the rise and fall of nation states by Paul Kennedy, written very much by, by scholars from the developed north, talking about the cyclical nature of, of, of systems. And I think we're reaching that point where we have entered the pivot or the pinnacle or, the, or, or, or we're cresting at that point where the international system is no longer going to be just about the gatekeepers. It's now opening up the space for access to different types of financing from different uh, institutions like the Chinese have created the, Afri uh, the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. You've got the New Development Bank by the BRICS uh, and, and you've got the Silk Road Fund. And I think these are the challenges to what has consistently been the kind of architecture that has remained the preserve of a few. And once that happens, then it becomes quite scary for those that now realize that there is competition or that there's challenges, and these challenges will represent the fact that there's choice, there's uh, alternatives, and these alternatives don't necessarily mean that uh, the leverage will always be your kind of soft power, yeah. and that's what it is, and I think that's where we are, and this is why I think it becomes almost critical to look at also what has become Trade. Trade is not just about whether you open markets, whether you're going to be knocked off the AGOA review schedule or whether you're going to lose market access. Trade has been weaponized. It's been the question around if you don't follow a particular kind of philosophy or, or be on the right side of history, then we're going to get we're going to come back and we're going to try and close off the trade. This used to happen in terms of the 1990s, where trade was very much along the lines of tariff barriers, uh, import taxes. So you can really access the markets in, in, in certain in certain yeah. geographical spaces because you had higher levels of tariff if there was more value addition in the product. And of course, if you wanted to there was protectionism of, of, of particular industries in those markets. Now it's just become geopoliticized in so many mm. ways. So how do we then strike that balance? How do we, one, ensure that we are aware of how um, weaponized that, that trade has become, but, but also we want to ensure that we as a sovereign state take our own decisions and stand by them and be unapologetic about the positions we take without being worrying about, oh, what is the U.S. going to think and what if they kick us out of Agoa, um, etc. How do you strike that balance then? I, I think not where we are now is looking around. I mean, it's, it's looking around and saying who's going to best represent our interests. 
And if it means that we have to get investments that don't come from our traditional partners, we have to work towards that. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy investment. It doesn't mean that the investment is just going to come in without any kind of uh, underlying issues that will actually need certainty, because there's a lot that we need to do in South Africa when it comes to structural economic reform, when it comes to policy certainty, when it comes to policy coherence, uh, when it comes to the way in which investments are, are, are going to be attracted. But I think the, the, the challenge is that the way the argument has been predicated on the fact that we're going to lose out on critical markets, that's true. But it also means that when you look at the number of countries that are seeking to uh, consider membership of the BRICS, you know, uh, in terms of what's going on, it's telling you, it's signaling something about the international system, that the international system is in a state of an inflection point. It is in a state of uh, an inherent contradiction that the markets that you consider to be your key markets also have to deal with the fact that we have other disruptors to this. And I think for South Africa, the challenge is really around dealing with the current conditions we find ourselves with load shedding, with the poor infrastructure, weakening uh, issues of service delivery, just the malfeasance around and the, and, 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 the, and, and, the, and the kind of weakened governance around our socio-economic development. And that need, that is the driver of our national interest, is our domestic development agenda. Who's going to serve that, I think, is going to be the way in which government seeks to bring in that investment. It doesn't only come from one space. It is a multiple set of, 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 of spaces that can offer that. Yeah. Sanusha Naidu, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation.